This video covers Fisher's exact test, which is a method for testing for independence, uh, generally in small samples and in small contingency tables. So a quick recap of tests for independence. The previous video discussed goodness of fit tests, but what if you don't have a prior expectation for abundance? For example, you might just want to know if the abundance of different rock types differs between two conglomerate beds. You don't know how much to expect, we just want to know are they the same in these two different beds. So another way of saying this is that the abundance of each rock type is independent of the bed in which it's found. So we want to know is the abundance independent of the sample that it comes from. So hence the name testing for independence. So the data will come in the form of something called a contingency table, which contains counts of items, the rows, in different categories or samples, the columns. So the item counts are contingent, which means that they're mutually exclusive. In the example here, one additional quartz in a particular bed means one less chert or basalt, because there's only 50 in total. We often talk about R by C, so R row by C column contingency tables. And this example here is a 3 by 4 contingency table. Some other terminology, if you add up the values in each row, they will sum to things, something called a marginal total, named because they're the margins of the column. There are marginal totals for the columns as well. So the marginal totals can take on three different cases. In case one, neither marginal total is fixed prior to doing your study. You might have that situation, but most often you'll encounter case two, when one of the marginal totals either the rows or the columns, is fixed prior to collecting the data. So that's the example here. In this hypothetical situation, we chose to count 50 rocks from each bed. So the column marginals are fixed at 50. However, we didn't know how many quartz or chert or basalt rocks we would find, so those totals weren't fixed beforehand. We had no idea of knowing how many we would come up with. In case three, both the row and the column marginal totals are fixed prior to collecting the data. This is hard to do outside of experiments, so it's not really common in observational earth science data. So Fisher's exact test was designed for two by two contingency tables. It technically applies only to those contingency tables where both the row and the column marginal totals are fixed prior to collecting the data. And as I said on the previous slide, that's kind of unlikely for most earth science data. But don't worry, it's, it's okay to run this test anyways, as we'll see in a minute. So the test looks for an association between the two sets of counts, with the null hypothesis that the frequencies are independent between the two samples. So basically, put another way, there's no association among the categories, or there's no difference in the abundance between the different samples. So Fisher's exact test is, as the name indicates, an exact test. So the p-value is calculated as the probability of obtaining an association between the categories at least as extreme as observed if the null hypothesis is true. Right, so the null hypothesis is of no association. The null hypothesis, is also, you could also say it's that they're, the, the, the counts are independent of the sample in which they come from. If that's the case, you would expect the counts to be equal in the two samples, right? If the abundance of chert or basalt is independent of the bed in which it occurs, it has to be the same in both of them. So the greater your observed counts deviate from that expectation of equality, the more likely the result is to be significant. And so the probability of observing a particular outcome in this test is calculated from a type of discrete probability distribution called the hypergeometric distribution. So you've seen a discrete distribution when we talked about the binomial test. And like in the exact binomial test, the p-value here is just the sum of the probabilities for all outcomes at least as extreme as your observation in both directions, right? We have to look in both directions, on both sides of the distribution, because we didn't have a prior alternative hypothesis that the association should be only in one direction or the other. So, a little bit about the hypergeometric distribution and why it, what, why it matters for this test. Uh, so it describes the outcome from a process called sampling without replacement. So to illustrate that, imagine you had a jar with M&Ms or some sort of colored candies in it. There's red ones and green ones and, and blue ones and many different colors. So you pick a candy out one by one and keep track of what colors you find. But you don't put them back in. So, so you sample them, 
but you don't replace them in the giant jar. Um, but because, it, because you don't put them back in the jar, the probability of finding a particular color changes over time as the pieces are removed. If you pick a bunch of red candies in a row, the probability of finding another one actually decreases because you're removing them from the, the population. So that's sampling without replacement. And it's for this reason that Fisher's exact test is only exact if both marginal totals are fixed. If we fix the marginal totals, that means that the total number of each item is set beforehand, and so removing one changes the probability of finding another. However, when the marginal totals aren't fixed, as in our case two, um, where only one of the marginal totals is fixed prior to doing the study, um, so remember, case two is sort of the most common one that you would see in observational data. Uh, the test is still applicable even in case one or case two. Uh, it's, it's conservative in those cases, and, and statist statisticians, when they say conservative, they generally mean that it's not more likely to get a type one error. So the, the, the risk of type one error is not elevated. So I mean, this is not great, but it's not really bad either. So essentially, Fisher's exact test is still the best choice when the counts are small, especially when some are zero, in a two-by-two two contingency table, regardless of the marginal total assumption. So when reporting the results of Fisher's exact test, you should provide the contingency table itself, the name of the test, and the p-value. And there's a few different ways which you can phrase the result, but you can use significantly different or not significantly different as you would for other tests. You could say that class composition didn't differ significantly or that it was significantly different. Or you could say the counts of the class were different or the counts of my observations were different. You could also use the association phrase, but that's maybe less intuitive, and so you could always just go with the, the counts didn't differ significantly or did differ significantly. So the R function is called Fisher.test, and it requires a single contingency table as the input. And you'll typically have to make that table yourself, either using the function matrix or the function table, which you'll learn in, in class. And the output will look like this, at least for a 2x2 two two contingency table it will. The p-value is really the key thing to focus on, and for now you can ignore the odds ratio statistics. Um, the 95% confidence interval given here is on the odds ratio. We haven't talked about odds ratios yet. We will in the logistic regression video in a little while. Uh, so for now, don't worry about the odds ratio. You can also perform Fisher's exact test on contingency, contingency tables that are larger than two by two. Um, but in that case, the R results won't give the odds ratio details at all.